Okay, without further ado, home Hierarchy and Anisotropy in Categorical Ontology by Noah Crane. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk about some work that I've been um, banging my head against now for, I don't know, a little short of a year. Um, so, essentially I'm trying to, uh, to like describe this phenomena that happens in category theory and mathematics where we can represent objects in a category by categories themselves. Now, you know, maybe you've heard of this movement of categorification. This, in a certain sense, is categorification if you were to view categorification as a functor. So let's just sort of see a little bit of um, uh, some examples here. So probably the, the preliminary example that I'd like to look at is that of a topological space. So if we think of a topological space as a tuple, um, where this is our set, and this is our uh, topology, and the whole thing is our space, right? Um, this comes with two different functors, okay? Um, so the first functor will associate to this topological space the underlying set, so we'll call that U of X. And I like to draw pictures. I'm going to draw a lot of pictures. So just to show you what this looks like, I mean, this is just points. There's no topology on this at all. Um, the other functor that I can associate to this um, is the category of open sets. So I can look at O of x. Um, and this will look like whatever. So I have u, uh, u, and u union u, whatever, and throw a bunch of primes in all of these. Okay, it's not really, doesn't really matter which uh, is which here. Okay, but the point is that uh, from this sort of uh, abstract data of a topological space, I can extract things that are a little bit more concrete. Um, in fact, they are actually categories. In a sense, this is a discrete category, and you know this is a thin category, but it's a category in its own right. Okay, so um, the thing that we can do with these categories is we can use them to index other objects. So we talk about indexing. Okay, so if you've studied uh, manifold theory, for example, you can think about the uh, tangent bundle of a manifold. Okay. Um, and at least on the level of sets, so if I take the underlying functor and apply it to this, um, I will get a coproduct that is indexed over the points of um, the underlying set of my manifold. Okay? And this is um, the uh, tangent space at a point. Okay? Um, on another level, I can think of sheaves, so, or you know, in general, pre-sheaves. And this is going to be a functor that goes from O of X into set. We'll just take set for example, right? Okay, so um, in both of these cases, I'm indexing a bunch of objects. In this case, it's uh, a bunch of uh, vector spaces. In this case, it's a bunch of sets. Um, and I can start asking about how to reconstruct um, a total object from these partial objects, right? So. I mean, in this case, we have these, um, these tangent spaces. These are sort of the atomic easy objects. All of them look like Rn, right? Um, and I can bundle them all together and get the tangent bundle. Um, in this case, uh, if I look at, for example, this functor applied to just some open set of my, um, my topological space X, Okay, I can use the sheaf condi condition to reconstruct um, the functor applied to all of x. And now just to draw out the full sheaf condition, it looks something like this. All right, so this is something that you're all used to uh, if you work with um, some category theory. Okay? So on the other hand, um, the O of x here itself is a sort of functor. Um, it's not just a category. Uh, o of x is a functor from the topology of x, considering that as a 
uh, category, you know, just, just a raw category, no data associated to it. And then it associates to it the topological spaces, which are the open sets. Okay. So um, in each of these cases, we have uh, a sort of a, a way to describe uh, a total space. Uh, you gotta explain that space. a little bit more. Yeah, yeah the, in that version of O of X, uh, what, what are the types of things? Like, in what category does this fit? Yeah, so if, if we look at the topology as just the raw poset or the raw category of open sets, so the uh, objects in this are just objects, they're not seen as open sets, we can associate to them the open set. As a topological space. Yeah, right, so, as a topological space. Oh, yeah, okay. right. cool. I mean, you get a little more than that, don't you? You get a topological space with its embedding into you. Yeah, right, sure, that, that's fine. But I just want to look at it like this. Okay. One second, so uh, I'm, I'm lost. Mm -hmm. uh, it's O of X is a functor, not O is a functor, but O of X is a functor. Yeah, O of X is a functor. And, and from where, from what category to what category? What's the difference between tau and O of X? So, okay, so there's a confusion of um, symbolism here, I guess. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I'm thinking of O of X as that category where the objects are open sets. In this case, I'm thinking of tau as just the category, and then I'm associating the open sets to it. Okay? It's just two different ways of thinking of the same thing. And this is sort of going to segue into what I'm going to talk about next, so maybe just suspend your disbelief. All right, suspend it. Okay. So, um, one of the uh, like general facts about covers, so if we want to talk about covers of a space, Right, so we have a bunch of open sets, and we are covering X. Okay. Um, from this, we can uh, associate uh, its... Um, oh, sorry. So from these covers of the space, we can take the co-limit of these covers. Right. So if we take the co-limit of these open sets, we get back our space. Okay. That's sort of one of the definitions of a covering, and if you want to think about this sort of more concretely, we're taking the union over these open sets. Right? Okay. So here's the question. Um, can we represent more arbitrary data in terms of coverings? So if X is no longer a space, but maybe some other concept, what does it mean to cover a concept by other concepts? Mm -hmm. um, so let's see what we can try to talk about. So there are two ingredients when we're trying to do this. The first ingredient, so ingredient one, okay? We can talk about uh, ontological laws. So this is just an idea by uh, David Spivak. Um, essentially, what this does is it um, uses categories to model uh, collections of things that are not necessarily mathematical objects. So let me give you a little picture of this. So I might have um, you know, my head, and embedded into my head is my mouth, mm -hmm. and embedded uh, is maybe my eye. Um, and then maybe a pupil. Pupil fam. And the way that this pupil embeds with the eye um, is a composition of how the uh, eye embeds into the head as well. Right, so that's, yeah, it's that's semantic networks which also have a composition, so there are categories. Exactly, yes, exactly. Um, so this is sort of the first ingredient. Mm -hmm. uh, the second ingredient. is uh, growth and deep topology. So now, instead of talking about um, open sets covering a space, these things are just uh, arbitrary objects. Okay. So, you might ask, well, why am I trying to do this? Why am I trying to cover concepts with other concepts? And the point is that I want to come up with a way of 
figuring out exactly what is causing a phenomena. So, um, exactly what causes a uh, phenomena. So, if I draw a little picture here, um, I have me and I have my head, okay, and I, my head is hurting me and I'm asking the question, why is my head hurting me? So if I look at head, I can um, ask about its cover, so check cover. And then I get something that looks something like this. So I have a head, and then I have my eye, and I have my uh, mouth, whatever. And then there's me, right? So um, my head is hurting me. Um, what is exactly hurting me? Well, actually, it turns out that my eye is what's hurting me. Okay. And so if I keep checking um, covers here, so for example, inside of my eye, I have a bunch of nerves. So I'll say nerve uh, 49, and I'll say nerve uh, 62, whatever. Um, and when I check this cover, I find out that it is nerve 49 that's hurting me. And if I check the cover of nerve 49, well, what I find is that inside this cover, there's a little cut, okay? Um, and this is just an example that I'm making up at, you know, as I go along here. But uh, the point is that from this sort of abstract uh, hurting, I can check covers uh, lower and lower until I get to something physical. Uh, this cut is activating this nerve. And, uh, and this whole composition is really what's hurting me, okay? So um, that's what I'm trying to do, but this model is actually not good enough, okay? So uh, there's a number of reasons why this model is not good enough. Let me just say one of them. Um, so when I had something like this, I have my eye embedding into my head, and my head is hurting me. Um, and it seems pretty reasonable to say that my eye is hurting me in the same way that it embeds into my head and my head is hurting me. Okay? So I can say that these things compose. It's fine. Um, but there's other morphisms in here. For example, there's the mouth. I'll try not to get too pedantic with this uh, example. Um, but you know, the, the mouth, my mouth is, feels fine. You know, it's not really what's hurting me. Um, but in a category, I should be able to compose these things. Mm -hmm. So the question is, well, what is this? Mm. I mean, it maybe doesn't exist. Um, and maybe it's, like, super complicated. But either way, um, the problem is with this composition. So the problem is actually with both of these ingredients. So. There are two different solutions to this. The first solution is instead of considering these coverings inside of the same category, we sort of blow them out into other categories. Okay? So um, this is going to involve a generalization. Okay, and we're going to go from covering uh, to expansion. Okay, and just to draw a picture of this, and I'll get formal in a second, um, the covering looks like this, okay? and the expansion we're going to be talking about living in a different category altogether. Okay, so, um, right. So we can attempt to describe this using what we already have. So just to go back to this open set functor here, um, my open sets go from this topology, which we consider as a small category, into top, realizing each of the elements of this small category as the open sets. Okay. Um, and, uh, oh sorry, I skipped a step here. I'm sorry. 
one thing in between this. So if we consider uh, the open set as a functor from um, the opposite category of topological spaces into cat, and each of these just associates the category of open sets to a topology, okay, then what we see is that O of x is fine, this is a category, so we haven't really violated anything. Okay, so if I just sort of draw a picture here, it looks something like this, whatever. But the uh, O of F, this is going to be sort of an in inverse image functor. This is going to be a functor from O of Y to O of X. And now I have to say that F is from X to Y. Okay. So you take its inverse image and that regards itself as a functor. So the way that I'm expanding here is... I'm really ending up in two different worlds, and I have a functor in between them. Okay, but this isn't really what I want um, because this doesn't say how O of f covers f. Okay. This is my f in this picture. This, these open sets here cover this x. These open sets here cover this y in a very meaningful way, right? I mean, I could take their co-limit, I could take their union, um, but I can't really take the uh, union of this functor, not in the way that you think uh, you can. Okay? So let's try something else, all right? And that's why I Doesn't introduced this. Doesn't one of these arrows go the other way, by the way, either f or o of that? Yeah. So let's try another thing. So this other thing now is to think of um, this O of X as a functor from um, tau of X into, uh, sorry. We think of this O as a functor from topological spaces into categories over top. Okay, and just to be very clear about this, O of X is going to be a functor from tau into top. Okay. Um, and you can finagle the definition of this over category as a sort of comma category. And you can consider uh, this O of f to instead be a subcategory of the comma category as follows. Okay. So this is a little um, different than maybe what you're thinking of. Okay, but we have these two small categories, the topologies of X and Y, um, and we have functors into top, and so the comma category is max in between them. And what I'm saying O of F is, in this case, is this is going to be the set of functions, uh, which I'll denote as FUV, and this is going to be F restricted to U as a function from U to uh, B. Okay, so B is in Y and U is in X. Okay. All right. So just to draw sort of what goes on here, I have my X and my Y, and I expand this, and I have a bunch of open sets. I mean, really, I'm looking at the image here, but forgive me for that. Um, okay, and. These all live inside of uh, top, okay? and these functions, or this collection of functions in a certain sense, um, are maps in between the open sets inside of here. Okay? So what we've recovered by going this route is this notion of covering for f. In a very real sense, um, these f's are restrictions of um, our total f, and we can take the co-limit over u to get f. Okay. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Okay. So the notion of covering is inside of this one. It's not inside of this one. Um, I want to make this a little bit easier to work with. Um, first of all, to regard a function or a morphism as some sort of subcategory, I mean, that seems a little uh, faux pas, right? Um, so there is a much 
uh, more combinatorial way of, of doing this. Okay? So that's what I'm going to get into now. Okay? So I'm going to talk about another generalization. Okay, so generalization two. The first generalization was to remove covering and go to expansion. The second generalization is to go from categories to simplicial sets. Okay. So um, a simplicial set, I mean one of the benefits we get from a simplicial set is A, that uh, composition doesn't need to exist. Right, but if it does, it doesn't need to be unique. So in a category, it has to exist and it has to be unique, right? uh, amongst other things. Okay. So let's see what we can do here. So uh, you, you lose yeah. direction also in simplicial sets, no? Direction? Of the morphism? No, no. Direction. No, no. It's it's only it's only um, the being confibered that causes you to lose the direction. Uh, okay. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, these are arbitrary simplicial sets. Okay. Um, and you can think of like the nerve of a category that would mean that these two things, you know, they need to exist and they're unique, right? Um, but these are arbitrary simplicial sets. Okay. So let's see. Uh, an example of why this might benefit us when we're talking about more arbitrary concepts than, you know, open sets or whatever. Okay, so let's give an example here. Okay, so um, I like this example a lot because I think I see it in a lot of slides um, at tech shows. Okay, so we have uh, Alice, Bob, and I'll just say me, and um, Alice is friends with Bob. And Bob is friends with me. Okay? So, I mean, it's pretty obvious that just because Alice is friends with Bob and Bob is friends with me doesn't mean that Alice is friends with me, so that composition doesn't need to exist. Right? This is fine. Um, and even if it does exist in some weirder sense, uh, it doesn't need to be unique. So maybe I can give something that looks a little bit more like this. Um, instead of friend, well, from this relationship, this composite relationship, I have that Alice can contact me. Okay? And in a simplicial set, I'm perfectly fine just formally saying that this works. Okay? But the point here isn't to formally say that these things work, it's to explain how they work. Right? So let's talk about this in terms of expansion. So if I look at expansion, right, and I haven't defined anything yet, so um, we just are going intuitively here. Uh, I can expand Alice. Okay, so um, inside of Alice, or what defines Alice, uh, will be her brain, for example, um, and her phone, and a bunch of other things, whatever. Okay, her brain is connected to her phone. Sounds like me. <laughs> right. Um, and likewise in Bob, uh, there are tons of things that define them, but I'll write just email uh, and phone. Okay. And inside of me, well, I have an email. Okay. Should draw this the other way. Okay. Um, and what is part of the friendship here? Uh, what defines this friendship? If I were to expand friendship. Well, amongst other things is the fact that he can contact her phone, or she can contact his phone. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll just write contact here. Okay, so just to stop for a second, this is going to be sort of an ex uh, expansion of A, um, an expansion of B, mm -hmm. and an expansion of me. Um, and then this is an expansion of friend, okay, so whatever. Um, and then likewise here, part of her friendship, or Bob's friendship with me, is that he can email me, 
And so it becomes pretty clear what this contact thing is actually supposed to mean. So it's not so much that I'm composing friend with friend to get contact. It's really that I'm composing contact with this ability for her phone to uh, talk to her email and then her email to contact my email. That whole composition is what this composition actually is, is representing. Okay? So I'll have contact here contact, and then there's some sort of composition here, which, you know, we're still taking for granted, but um, seems more likely. Okay. So, I guess I'll go all the way over here. I like having this many boards. Lot of space. All right, in a worst possible scenario, you've still got two more walls. Okay. <laughs> go back there. <laughs> Well, the camera can't turn around that much. No, no, sure, no, can. no, 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 It's not a tripod with a rotating thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so let me give you um, an intuitive description of ontological expansion before I give you a formal one. Okay, so, um, so we'll talk about ontological expansion. And by the way, I don't know if I actually said this, I'm regarding these simplicial sets here, the whole thing as some ontology, and uh, the expansions here are ontological expansions. Okay, so that's what I mean when I say ontological expansion. So um, there are multiple levels on sort of a zero level. Okay, I am taking a simplex, a zero simplex, in some simplicial set. Okay, so let me just say let this be a simplicial set. So I have a zero simplex, and I'm going to be sending that to um, a sub-simplicial set of some other simplicial set. Okay? So from a single element, I get a whole simplicial set. Okay? Um, and so what this might look like is a map that goes from uh, zero into the sub um, simplicial sets of sigma prime. Okay. Um, and likewise, I have on the one level, um, I'm going to be sending a one simplex uh, to the sub simplicial sets of a sort of restricted version of the simplicial set. So here I have my simplicial set. And I want to restrict this below to 1. Okay, so I'm throwing out the 0 simplexes. I only care about the 1 simplexes. Okay. And the way that I do this, really, is I have a functor, uh, we'll call it J1, from some restricted simplex category. So this is everything uh, greater than um, zero, and this is a functor into um, the actual simplex category. Okay. And so this sub here, I mean, this I should write in air quotes, and what this really is, is uh, the sub simplicial sets of a restricted um, simplicial set. Okay. Let's see how many times I say simplicial set in one sentence. Well, at least you don't have strings like simplicial, co-simplicial, simplicial set. Right, yeah, yeah. Or maybe you haven't gotten to those yet. Uh, well, they're hidden, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I can just keep going. I can define my J2 sort of the same way. I have this restricted simplex category, um, and it's being sent in, it's embedded into my traditional simplex category. And so on the second level, I have um, the two simpl simplexes are sent to uh, sub-restricted simplicial sets like this. Okay. So just to differentiate this. Okay. So let's see what happens in general. Okay. In general, I have these, uh, these functors here that go from restricted simplex categories into my total simplex category. 
Okay? And what an ontological expansion should look like, and by the way, this is still wrong, what an ontological expansion should look like is it should send a uh, simplicial set um, on sort of the kth level into these sub-simplicial sets like this. Okay, so let's give this a name. Okay, these are going to be called the submorphisms, and the reason I'm, I'm calling them submorphisms is that they're sort of underneath the morphisms. You take a morphism and you expand it into its submorphisms. Right, so I'll call this um, S M of sigma prime, and then K. Okay, so this is the kth level submorphisms. So this is a definition of K submorphisms. Okay. So there's a formal categorical way of defining this. Okay. So let's sort of look at this. I've been using sub now as a sort of uh, intuitive word, you, you can talk about the uh, sub-simplicial sets, but what is really, what, I mean, what are we really talking about? So this guy here, well, let's see what we have in a, a bigger diagram. We have this k-restricted simplex category. I'm embedding that into my simplex category. And I have my simplicial set, which is a functor into set. Okay? And the sub-simplicial sets here are going to be, well, I have some indexing functor, and then I have a natural transformation into uh, this restricted category. Okay? So the category of these, I can write as the functors from this restricted simplex category into set uh, over specifically the restricted simplicial set sigma. Okay. And this is my definition of the submorphisms, the K submorphisms. It seems like it would be more economical to define this as just O is a map of simplicial sets going the other way. Doesn't that turn out to be the same thing by using pre-images to get these subsets? Yeah, it's, it's possible. Um, I, I guess it's a, a way that you might be able to look at it. I don't know if the rest of the constructions, I mean this is really just the beginning of what I want to talk about. So I don't know if the rest of the constructions are going to work this way, like with what you're saying, but um, yeah, it's possible. Um, and by the way, like the next step that I'm going to take after this is really I don't need set and I don't need simplex category. Um, really everything can work in general and, and there's a meaning to that generality as well, but we'll get to it. Okay. Um, all right. So what we have so far is a, um, well, we have our simplicial set sigma, and we have these submorphisms um, at each level, okay? And so an ontological expansion at the kth level should be a map just from um, these uh, k simplices into these k submorphisms, okay? And so we'll sort of just leave it at that for now. Um, but if you look at the simplicial sets, well, they have sort of face maps. And these face maps should be interacting with these submorphisms. Okay? Um, but the problem is we don't necessarily have that yet. Okay? So what is that? Um, really what this boils down to is how is SM of sigma some sort of simplicial object. So we'll say a simplicial object into cat, for example. Okay. Um, and from what I have so far, I don't have any way of actually talking about that. Uh, so let's just take a step back for a second. 
<clears throat> so, <coughs> hold on. Sort of lost myself. Hmm. Right, so there are two problems. So, first of all, um, this, uh, these amorphisms land in categories, whereas a simplicial set lands in sets. <coughs> So I can't really connect those two, that's problem one. <coughs> and problem two is that these face maps don't exist. <coughs> uh, so let's try to define it, let's deal with uh, the faces. So I made a number of choices here in, in defining the submorphisms. Okay. Um, and what are those choices? Well, first of all, uh, the first choice I made was a functor, which I called JK from delta into, um, from this restricted simplex category into the actual simplex category. And another choice that I'm going to make Um, is a special choice of, um, of level of simplexes that are going to help me determine my faces. So the second choice that I'll make, and it'll become clear why I'm making this choice, is maybe um, the nth level inside of uh, this restricted simplex category. And to keep things diagrammatic, I'm going to realize this as a functor from the one-point category into this restricted category. The CN is just uh, like the constant functor at N. Okay. Um, okay. So altogether, this choice resolves itself as a single choice, which I'll just call J. And this goes from our simplex category into the category of functors, from the one-point category into delta, and there's a little modification here with little 2 here. So let me just say something about that 2. Okay? So this 2 is going to give me both of these choices in 1. So if I evaluate j of n, what I get is I get a uh, functor into uh, delta n, a choice of object. And I also get an embedding into my simplex category. So that two means compositions of two functors. Okay. And my j of f, okay, so if f is a functor, uh, sorry, if f is a map from n to k, then we'll have a diagram that looks something like this. And we'll have a natural transformation here. So this is my J of F. For us, this is really easy. So J of F is a natural transformation between these two functors. I just need to tell you what it does at, um, at the star, at the one point in the one point category. And it gives you exactly F. So it just becomes really itself. And just keep in mind that this is actually a choice, and I can vary this at the end of the day. Okay, but for sort of exposition, I'm keeping it um, very simple. All right. So let's see now how we can use these choices to define the faces of a submorphism. <coughs> So, let me give you a set theoretic definition of the faces of a submorphism. So this is like a set theory def. Okay. So, um, so if we have some face map, so this, for example, is uh, the domain or the codomain. Um, but regardless, we're going from n simplices to n minus 1 simplices, okay? So faces of the uh, n simplex, okay? We say that uh, a submorphism, uh, S 
n minus 1, okay, is an f base of Sn, okay, if uh, every n simplex in Sn, we get that the face of that n simplex is in uh, Sn minus 1. So let's see what this looks like. So here I have my restricted simplicial set. So I have like um, composed with Jn. I'll call this Jn minus 1, actually. And here we have our submorphism living inside of here somewhere. So this is n minus 1. And here is our next level some morphism, Sn, okay? And Sn minus 1 is a face of Sn because it contains all of, in this picture, the domains of Sn, okay? But one thing you might notice is that this is not a uh, uh, determinant uh, condition in that uh, multiple um, n minus 1 submorphisms can actually satisfy this. So I have some other Sn minus 1 submorphism inside of here, so this is Sn minus 1 prime. Uh, that also will count as a face, as long as it contains all of the faces. Yeah. Okay. So really what we're getting at here is that the face, the quote-unquote face of a submorphism is not just a single uh, submorphism, but rather an entire subcategory of the n minus 1 submorphisms. Okay. All right. Good so far? So this is a set theory definition. We want to give a much more formal uh, category theory definition so that we can actually um, generalize this pretty, pretty significantly. Okay. So let's look at what we have. Well, if you recall the definition of a submorphism, which is probably somewhere over there, uh, we have this sort of index category into set, uh, index functor into set. And we have our restricted simplicial set. Okay. And the submorphism <coughs> is a map between these two things, formally. Okay. So when I pre-compose this with uh, my CN, what this gives us is the n simps of Sn, yeah, of Sn, okay? And what this gives me, if I recompose this here, are the n sims of sigma. Um, and then on the other hand, I have this J of F. So this should be K. So here I have a J of F. Okay, this is a natural transformation between um, these two uh, composites of functors. And if I post-compose by my simplicial set here, what I'm essentially getting is the K uh, F faces of uh, SN. Okay. So all together here, uh, I can whisker this to, uh, to be something like this, S-O-C-N, and I can whisker this to be something like this, um, sigma of J of F. Okay. And so all together, uh, the composite gives me the K F faces of, uh, of SN. Okay. These are K simplices. So 
maybe you're looking for confusion, is that this whole object here gives me the k simplices of sigma. Um, and so the composite gives me the k f bases. Okay, so maybe I should draw something like this. So let me write this in sort of a better diagram. I mean, I just sort of wanted to um, introduce it this way. Um, so the better diagram here is that we have this in of cn, that's this guy, and then we have um, our, uh, let me just write it down from here, our restricted simplex, and then choosing the n simplices of that. And then here we have, again, our restricted simplex, but the uh, k-level restriction. Okay, and this is Sn of Cn, and this is um, sigma j of f, okay? Um, and I can do what I did here for the k simplices as well. So if I have another submorphism, so this is a, a k submorphism in this case, um, I can do the same thing, restricts to just its k simplices to get... Um, the k simplices of my k submorphism. Okay? And the point is that this condition happens exactly when I have a completion to this diagram. Okay? So I look at the n simplices. What this is saying is that um, there's a way for me to associate the n simplices to their uh, k faces right? um, by following this diagram. Okay, one thing that <clears throat> that like was slightly confusing me is when when you're and let me see if it's not confusing me anymore. When you're referring to um, submorphisms, um, these are not single simplices in delta prime. They are, I mean, sorry, uh, sigma prime. They are sets of. <laughs> One submorphism is an entire set of simplices. Right. Um, restricted below by the one level. So yeah. it's not just an arbitrary sub collection of simplices, it's a sub collection of simplices that doesn't go below uh, one mm -hmm. and satisfies a bunch of face conditions as well. So, I mean, like, there's a, if you have a two simplex inside of a one submorphism, its face should still be in there, whereas if you have a one simplex of a one submorphism, its face doesn't need to be in there. Okay. Um, so some, something like this here. So this would be a one submorphism. It could have everything, right? It's not restricted by anything. But this is, sorry, zero submorphism. This is a one submorphism, meaning that um, I can only look at uh, the one simplices and maybe some composites going on over here. Okay, but I, I don't go below. Does that make sense? I, I could probably explain that better, but I don't know. Lost it. All right, so, uh, so we have this diagram here. This is exactly this condition. Okay, so um, I want to come up with the solution to this condition that is the entire category of these solutions. Um, and that's going to give me my, uh, my face map for submorphisms. Okay? So maybe I shouldn't walk all the way over there from this. Can I erase this here? So let's make uh, a number of observations, okay? Okay, so the first observation, well, let me compose this here. So here I get a big composite, I'll just write it down over here. This I is going to be a map in a certain sense, and I'll just say that in a second. So we're looking at that top composite, so we have uh, Sn, Cn, and then we're composing them as natural transformations, and we have sigma of j of f here. 
So I is going to be a map from that whole composite into uh, SK of CK. Okay. Um, and everything here, uh, this regarding this as a morphism from this to this, is essentially looking at an overcategory. Okay, so this guy is a functor from um, the one point category into a uh, set. Okay, it's a bunch of composites. Um, uh, or, sorry, no. Um, this maps between functors from the one point category into set. Okay, so this is actually in the one point category over set. Um, into, uh, let's see, this specific functor. And I didn't realize how complicated this was until I tried to write it on a board in front of people who aren't inside my mind, so I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, this, so we have a morphism in this strange category. Let's call this QK. Okay, just for sanity. Okay. So I, we're, we're seeing this as a morphism, but now we can also see it as an object in another overcategory. Namely, we are looking at things underneath this whole crazy composite. And trust me, this has a punchline. So even if you're not understanding what I'm doing here, um, I think you'll understand the punchline. So uh, we have this uh, morphism is now an object in another overcategory, okay? And uh, the domain of I, okay, if we just look at this, the domain of I is SK of CK, okay? And um, we can also write this as uh, the pullback of SK uh, of CK along SK, or SK along CK. Okay. okay, so what we have now um, is we have some submorphisms, the K level submorphisms. Okay, we map this under CK into this crazy category QK. Okay, that's essentially what's going on here. And on the other hand, we have this crazy over category. I'm almost done with this. And then the punchline will maybe be a little bit better. You're missing a parenthesis. Where? Oh. And sigma composed J of F. You have a pro the end right, of the right there. there. Under this, in the second, no, up a little, up. Okay. <laughs> um, so we have these two functors, and essentially we can define the face category as the pullback along these functors. And what this is saying is that, um, so let me just finish writing this. What this is saying is that uh, these, so this bottom diagram is saying that. Um, it has all F faces, and this right diagram says that it comes from a submorphism, a K submorphism specifically. And so what this face category is giving us now um, is it's the category of K submorphisms that have all the F faces of SN, okay? So that's sort of the punchline. Um, so this allows us to define things, and I did this, you know, there's, there's a lot of painstaking work in doing this, and you might ask, why am I doing this? Um, and really the purpose is that I want to generalize beyond simplicial sets. Mm -hmm. So let me just, like, give you a bunch of, you know, I'm not going to prove them in front of you, facts. Um, that are going to make things a little bit clearer, okay? Well, you've replaced all your, your inclusions with arrows now. 
Yeah, um, so I mean, this is an inclusion. That's yeah. definitely true. Um, but yeah, I, I, I sort of throw away monomorphisms a lot. Um, you know, what, what, when thinking of them as sub-objects, yeah. because, well, I don't know, maybe that's more of a philosophical thing than, than yeah. an actual math thing. I mean, right. the math works out. Right, but I meant you've replaced all your set inclusion with actual arrows and diagrams. Yeah, yeah, exactly. By this point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, when you look at this diagram here, literally nothing about simplicial sets is actually necessary for mm -hmm. this. Really, just the fact that it's a functor category. But I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, so, what we have now um, is we have this f of um, uh, this f of S n. Okay, so the faces of S n. This is a subcategory of the submorphisms, the k submorphisms. Okay. Um, so let me write this a little bit more uh, suggestively. So let me write this as SM sigma of F of SN. Okay. So what's happening here is that actually SM sigma of F, okay, let me throw away this SN, um, is functorial in SN in a certain sense. Okay, and this is going to take um, its domain is the N submorphisms, okay? And its codomain is now uh, a power category, okay? So the intuition here is that for every N submorphism, I get a entire subcategory of K submorphisms, okay? Um, and I can take it a step further uh, I can remove this f now, and I can actually talk about um, SM of sigma as if it was a simplicial object. Okay, so now I land in cat, but this p is a monad. Okay, so really I'm talking about the Clisey category of cat with respect to this, this monad. Okay. So, um, I can take it one step further, okay, and this SM is actually a functor which takes the functor category, okay, so this is the simplicial sets, so it takes this functor category into this functor category. Um, and I'm actually lying to you a little bit, but just give me a second. Okay, so. The reason I'm lying to you is that this actually isn't a functor. This is a lax functor. Okay, so they should really be going into the lax functors. Okay. Cat is a two category. With natural transformations. And just to say something about the laxness, um, if we look at this class here, uh, we have all SL such that it contains uh, G faces of all SK such that contains F faces of SN. Okay, so just consider this as a set or class or whatever. Um, this is going to be like my F of, or sorry, G of F of um, SN. And this is a stricter condition than saying that SL, or looking at the class of SL such that um, it contains G of F faces. So I have to check more here than I have to check here, and this is exactly where um, the lax condition comes from. So this is G of F of SN. Okay, so this is my lax transformation. Cool. Yeah. Makes the makes the carrot bigger. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Continuing my theme of bothering you to turn things backwards. Um, Please do. <laughs> um, that lax thing on the right is going to be an awful lot like 
like some kind of uh, vibration over the simplices. I'm not sure quite how to account for the P yet, but um, right. but it will be like a cloven, but not necessarily split cloven uh op vibration over delta. Yeah, you're you're probably right. Yeah, and this is um, I guess a route that I have recently discovered, and I didn't want to throw away a bunch of work uh, for that, but I might because it might become simpler. In fact, like as I go deeper into this things become a lot more complicated and it might be easier to sort of build on top of actual established theories. So, um, yeah, th thanks for bringing that up. That's probably true um, in some sense. Okay. So, uh, let's see. Um, so, Let's sort of go back to the problems, which conveniently are right here, okay? So this uh, SM of sigma, these submorphisms, are functors into cat, actually they're functors into cat p, but sigma is a functor into set, so what do we do about that? Um, that is going to be a, um, the next point here, so we're going to talk about some trivialization functors. So first of all, let me make it really clear. This SM is a functor from this functor category into this lax functor category. Okay, so if we want to talk about maps from sigma to the isomorphisms of sigma, we need to upgrade sigma in a similar way. Okay? Intuitively, we are sending zero simplexes to zero submorphisms, so we don't really want to add anything to it. So we want to do this in the most trivial way possible. So let's look at what sigma is. Well, it's a functor from the simplex category into set. Um, and then there's a discrete or free category on a set. Just add the identities. And then there's a Clicy inclusion. So, um, so this is going to give you submorphisms consisting basically of only the uh, simplicial um, and simplex for. Well, when you, well, it's going to be it's all, all the submorphisms are just going to consist of a single simplex. Um, so yeah, I'm so they're they're, they're, saying, yeah, they're uh, each going to like like the zero submorphism will be will be a simplicial point. Um, or a simplicial zero simplex. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, it will be a single, it will be a set of a single simplex, or a set right. of a single one simplex. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what's going on here. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, let's see. So now if we want to talk about this, well, uh, really we have to lift it via this construction and Essentially, this just gives us another functor, which we'll is right over here, this trivial functor, where um, this trivial functor is the post composition with this kp and this free, right? That's fine. Okay. And so um, an ontological expansion, which is what I originally wanted to describe, is actually now a natural transformation from this trivialized um, simplicial set into the submorphisms of some other simplicial set. Okay? All right, so let's just sort of do a little bit of a sanity check here. What is actually going on? Okay, well, um, like you said, the objects inside of here, so let's look at uh, this. This will be a, or sorry, TR of this. This is a one point Things. So I'll have like a n simplex here. Let's say I'll have a one simplex here. Okay. So I should have a one. Then I'll map down to um, zero by checking its domain. So here I have tr sigma zero, and here I have a power category. Okay. 
Um, and this is really still just going to be like the set of the set of one um, simplex. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, then I can map over via my first level of ontological expansion. Okay, and I get a submorphism. So I get a one submorphism. So we'll call that O of sigma. And here I map down via the domain. And so this will map to the DOM of sigma 1. Okay? And if I do the ontological expansion on this level, um, what I end up with is uh, the um, expansion of the domain of sigma 0. Or sorry, sigma 1. Okay, and this is a lax square. Okay, so really what this is saying is that the um, expansion of the domain of a simplex counts as a domain of the expansion of a simplex. So if I draw sort of a picture of what's going on, so I... Uh, so here I have a zero simplex and a one simplex and another zero simplex, okay? Uh, and this is being expanded into some some morphism, some zero morphism. This again is also expanded into a zero morphism, and then I have some one morphism here, and so what this Lax diagram is saying is that the uh, domain, uh, sorry, the expansion of the domain counts as a domain of the expansion. Okay. So let's see what I've been talking about so far in another diagram, just as a little recap. So, so far I've just talked about expansion, and I haven't really talked about hierarchy. So, um, we had these Prothendieck topology uh, sort of coverings. We had um, these ontological logs, which are categories, and this gave us um, sort of coverings of concepts. Okay, I generalized to simplicial sets, and I generalized to expansion, and this gave us our submorphisms. Okay, so the next step is to generalize this to something that I call a basic ontology. And then we'll package this all together into a hierarchical ontology. Okay. So let's see if I can do this in the next uh, 20 minutes. All right. So I don't know. Maybe I'm moving around a little bit too much. I'll go here. So there are a number of generalizations. The work that I did in describing um, the submorphism functor doesn't necessarily need to be with the simplex category and um, with sets. So remember the choices that I had. So the choices that I made at the beginning, uh, since the beginning, are that we are working with the simplex category. We have this J that I described, and we have uh, sets. Okay, these three choices can be changed arbitrarily. 
um, as long as they're functors and they're categories. So we can upgrade this no matter what. So this, from now on, this delta doesn't mean the simplex category. Sorry about that. Um, this delta just means a small category. This j uh, is still a functor. And we're just working with now a category. Yeah. <clears throat> and so uh, what we can define now is a basic ontology. So a basic ontology is just a functor uh, from delta into C, the same way that simplicial sets is a basic ontology. It's a basic way of organizing things. Okay, so there are, as examples, there's just sets. This is a way of organizing things. There's uh, graphs. Okay, there's uh, simplicial sets. Okay, um, there's also globular sets. Okay, another way of organizing data. Um, and let's get away from set, so uh, topological space is a way of organizing data. Okay, I can look at um, sort of these infinity n categories. Okay, and I can think of them as uh, n fold simplicial uh, spaces. Okay. Um, there's a lot of these, I mean, we can get as fancy as we want. We can talk about, like, Lovier theories. Um, just as certain special functors from some T into a uh, set. Okay. Um, you have a question? Uh, yeah. This, this type you have for J, um, delta to fund from a point to delta. Mm. Isn't that really just the same as functors from delta to delta? Because you can, you can like curry and uncurry it and just get, funct and just get func functors. It's a functor mm -hmm. from a point to right. functor so it's to be delta comma delta. So it's so you're saying that this should be, like, something like this. Um, is this what you're saying? No, that's not what you're saying. I mean, the, th the things inside of this is a, is, um, a composition of two functors. Uh, this is essentially in considering, uh, it's been a while since I looked at exactly this, um, considering this as a simplicial category. Uh, th considering the, the functor set as a simplicial category. Um, where the, that uh, might not be exactly right, um, I don't know, M maybe I'll talk to you about it afterwards, okay. yeah. um, and we can see what's going on. So, I mean, these are all examples, um, I should stop listing examples except for this last one, um, but it doesn't necessarily fit into what a basic ontology is, um, well, these expansion ontologies, um, which are now going to be lax functors into that P. Okay? So uh, when I defined a basic ontology, I didn't necessarily talk about lax functors. Okay? And the reason I defined a basic ontology is because the construction of submorphism works for arbitrary functors, but the question is, does that construction work for arbitrary lacks functors, and the answer is actually yes. Okay, so a basic ontology is a uh, functor where this is now lacks, and this is a two category. And you can think of a one category as a two category by just adding in identities, and that's it. And so you can think of uh, a regular functor as a lacks functor, and that's fine. Um, and maybe you're wondering, like, do I have to upgrade to three categories? Um, 
and then do I have to upgrade it to four categories every time I do this? Um, the answer is, well, if you really take into heart the different levels of morphisms, yes. But actually, in defining the somorphisms, and I'm not going to go into this, so um, whatever, I can actually throw away some of the modifications and, and be okay. Modifications being the two morphisms. Okay. Um, so, all right. So, we have this uh, basic ontology and this SM functor now, which depends on C and also depends on J. So, let me be very explicit. Uh, this is a functor from the uh, lax category, and it always lands in cat. Um, so, you might be asking, well, what's the point? Why do we want some morphisms of some morphisms? And that's because we want to be able to compose expansions. Okay, so uh, let's consider this. So, if we have one ontological expansion, which looks something like this, so I'll use B from now on. And we have another ontological expansion, which looks like this. prime, B prime, and B double prime. Okay? You might ask, how do we compose this? So just in pictures, we have one expansion, and inside of this we have multiple expansions as well. Okay, so how do we compose this to get one big expansion? Well, the somorphism um, functor here is still a functor uh, when we're talking about um, cat P, and so we can actually apply uh, SM cat P now to this, so we have TR of B, uh, sorry, SM of TR of B prime, and SM of SM of B prime, okay, so this is SM of O. Okay. And so, if we want to um, compose this into one big ontological expansion, we need something here. So, what is this? And we need something here. So, I have some answers to this, but actually we're running out of time. So, let me just say something about what I want this to look like. Okay. So essentially what we have um, is that we want to have a category called aunt. Okay, and the objects of this category are going to be basic ontologies. And the morphisms of this category are going to be Um, ontological expansions. Okay. So, um, each of the objects here are ways of organizing data, and each of the morphisms here are ways of elaborating on data. And so, what a hierarchical ontology is, so a hierarchical ontology, is then a uh, subcategory of this. So we'll say O, and we'll map that into ONT. And it doesn't have to be Monica, actually. Okay? And so just to draw a picture of this, and maybe I'll leave it at that, is we have, um, let me give actually an example of this. So, in this case, my O, just as a category in and of itself, is going to consist of three objects. Okay, it's going to consist of 
atomic, uh, local, and global. Okay, and we'll have maps like this. Okay, this is like a schema for how I want to um, consider various levels of my data. Okay, and when I map this into ONT, what happens is that I get a, um, uh, we'll say, simplicial set, or just a basic ontology in general, of things that are global. So I'll say me uh, driving my car. Okay, so this is like a, a global statement. Right, very abstract. And then I go to expansions, local statements. Um, so, you know, inside of me I have feet, um, and I have hands. And to avoid getting too um, detailed here, I have a wheel, um, a pedal, I'll have gas, and I'll have an engine. Okay? And the point is uh, that this driving, um, this points to my hands touching the wheel or my feet touching the pedal. And the question is, you know, how is my feet touching the pedal driving the car? Okay, so the pedal is somehow attached to the gas, which is attached to the engine, and the wheel is attached to, well, I guess there should be an axle, but forget about that for now. And so this next level, so this is my local. So this next level is my atomic. And at this level, I want things to be actually rigorous. So if I expand this pedal, uh, actually, let me expand the, the gas. So if I expand the gas, I have some actual um, molecules. And I expand the engine, I also have some actual molecules. And the gas moving the engine is a result of the forces that those molecules are exerting on each other. Okay? So, this is really, I guess, nothing new. I guess the thing that I want to describe here is a way from, to get from abstract ideas down to concrete ideas and to explain them that way through ontological expansion. Okay? All right, I think you should probably stop there. Yeah. Any questions? Any discussion? Sure. Where does the uh, anisotropy come in to the story? Um, so the anisotropy is, um, so, okay. Anisotropy as it relates to uh, like computer graphics. What that means is that if you are close to an object in a 3D world, you have to talk about its resolution at its full resolution. Mm -hmm. But if you're super far away from it, you can have something that's a lower resolution and be fine. So the so you, end, yeah. So you mean, say, at the atomic level, the categories in your, at your atomic level have no isotropy? Is that? Uh, well, what I'm saying is that if I am far away from this, and I don't really care about the details, then me driving the car is enough for me. But if I am close by and I'm trying to see exactly how I'm driving the car, um, then I actually have to look at these different levels of detail. So the anisotropy, and I guess it sort of goes against the actual word, like get anti-isotropy, um, but really. yeah. just means absence of isotropy. Right. So at at different you know perspectives, you have more detailed views. It's where the anisotropy comes in. Any other questions? I think we should thank our speaker again. Uh, hold on.